me a quarter. I want to buy a lotto ticket. You will do no such thing. The end game has officially begun, pals. I'm so happy this episode came out swinging way harder than I thought it would, but it still feels a bit bittersweet knowing that this is the beginning of the end. What a great way to start a video, huh? Definitely not a mood killer. <laughs> Please don't hate me. The New Normal was without a doubt the best season opener episode this show has had so far. I know there's only three options total to choose from, but this episode definitely took the cake. It being a full 22 minutes episode helped a lot too. Before I get into the nitty gritty of this episode, I do want to give a quick spoiler warning to those who haven't fully caught up or even watched Amphibia yet. Please do so. It's so worth it. I really should do these spoiler warnings more often. I, I don't do them enough and I want to start doing them more. Okay breakdown time. The episode opens with the Planner family looking around the LA freeway, super shocked by their surroundings. Sprig looking at an airplane and Polly looking at the inflatable floppy arm man from the car dealership, which were all shown in the main trailer for the first half of the season. And like I initially predicted, were shown at the very start of this episode before Anne makes it back to her parents. After the gang runs off the freeway, we get that big wide shot of the city also from the trailer. Anne thinks she's dreaming, so to test if she's actually home, she checks her cell phone service to see she's got full bars at 5G. She's finally back. The episode cuts to what's starts the sneak peek clip shown at this year's Comic-Con at home, and walking down the street with the planners somehow going completely unnoticed by the rest of society. Unless she just lives super close to that freeway, I don't understand how she made it there unscathed. Reuniting with her parents, them seeing the planners, being insane, you get the gist of it. I, I feel like I've talked about what happens here like four different times, so forgive me for not going super into detail about these scenes again. <laughs> After Anne's father faints, we skip a little into the future with Anne in the middle of explaining her adventures in Amphibia. Minus the calamity powers, betrayals, and invasion of course. The first thing that came to mind when I saw all these diagrams was that scene from It's Always Sunny of Charlie trying to figure out who Pepe Silvia is. Even if you've never watched that show, I'm sure you've seen the meme picture of it at least once in your lifetime. Anne's father is the first to respond to this rundown, still unshocked about there being a talking frog world called Amphiboland, which was a nice little Easter egg reference to what Amphibia was originally called during its pilot before being picked up by Disney as a full series. Polly kicking Mr. Boonchoy throughout this episode as a way to break in her new legs was a cute little running gag this episode. I hope it continues to future episodes do. Her parents initially refute the idea of the planner staying at their house and think it would be best to leave them to the authorities. But after seeing how much Anne cares for their safety and well-being, they decide to allow the planners to stay. The only catch is the house has to go on complete lockdown so nobody on the outside knows they exist. Cue the quarantine song. Man, TJ Hill did a great job on this. Super catchy. And fun fact, the majority of this episode was produced during COVID with the exception of the script. It's as if Matt knew it was coming this whole time. And some Simpsons energy. Shout out to them for continuing the grind even during those harder times. Actual go. When Anne and the planners first entered Anne's room, I noticed several details when it came to the decorations. First, the several Thailand flags hung on the back wall since Thailand is the root of her heritage, which we all know she takes a lot of pride in. A flag with the initials SJMS, which stands for St. James Middle School, aka the school she attended. And I'm using past tense right now because I have no idea if she still is technically enrolled there. Is that a freaking BTS poster? B pack it up, everyone. Anne's a K-pop stan. Give it up. Lastly, there's a poster that to me looks like a cropped off version of a Pokeball, or at least this universe's version version of one. I suppose I can forgive Anne for being a BTS stan if she likes Pokemon. The rest of the montage more or less is just the planters acting like complete degenerates inside Anne's house. Flooding the bathtub, Sprig microwaving a book, Polly riding Domino. At one point, Anne uses Dougal. Anyone remember that movie? Which is Amphibia's version of Google to look up how to defeat an evil Newt King, but closes the laptop after her mom gets suspicious. Towards the end, we can see Anne's parents get progressively more overprotective, refusing to let Anne or the planters even look outside the house windows. Anne's mother in particular is acting extra extra crazy, which I did think was going to happen. While Anne is in the middle of sleeping, she starts brushing Anne's hair. And if you look at Anne's bed frame, you can see Sasha and Marcy carved their initials there, right below the BFF carving. The next morning when looking outside of the home, it shows the Boon Choys live at the corner of Lee Street and Huang Drive. Anne's sanity finally cracks after her mom appears out of thin air in the bathroom while Anne is trying to brush her teeth. Family meeting time. During this little meeting, we learn Anne was in Amphibia for about five months. That'll be more important later in this video, so put a pin in that. Anne prompts the idea of being allowed outside with the planners for an hour in order to get some space. Anne's parents initially oppose this idea until Anne suggests they all go to the market together instead of just her parents going. Thinking Anne still isn't responsible enough, especially after considering her track record, Hop Pop attempts to make a case for her about how much she's grown while in Amphibia, bringing up how she was voted Frog of the Year by frogs that used to hate her as an example. Her father seems to agree with Hop Pop, thinking Anne has felt more mature since returning, so he and his wife agree to letting 
them come to the market. And tries to get the planter psyched up about Earth being a cakewalk compared to Amphibia and how nothing is gonna try to kill them for once. Little does she know, Andrus is sending the lanky Frobo after them as they speak. Not gonna lie, I did not expect this thing to be making an appearance so early and having such a major role so early. I thought, if anything, he'd get transported to Earth at the very end of the episode, not halfway through it. This isn't a bad thing by any means, I'm just very surprised. Andreas gives it the mission to eliminate Anne and pick up the latest Cynthia Coven book, which is the book series Marcy showed Maddie in the episode Marcy and Maddie. Say what you want about Andreas, but at this point, we can't say he completely deceived Marcy. His love for Cynthia Coven is genuine. When Lanky leaves, Andreas talks to an unconscious Marcy about how her friends are about to be eliminated from the equation and how her part is just beginning. And we all know what he means by her part. I'm surprised her tube is inside the throne room, though, because in the season three opening, the tube is in the night chamber. Perhaps Andreas is planning to move her down there once she's recovered more? I guess we'll have to see. The Frobo is able to locate Anne off the energy she gives off from her calamity powers, even if she's not in the middle of using them. Even if she's miles away, this thing can still detect her location. It's also got a stealth mode, which prevents it from being seen by the other humans and gives it the advantage in sneak attacks. Truly a threat to behold. I just noticed that while this thing is hopping around in stealth, there's signs in the background for Trader Flows, which is a reference to the real life store Trader Joe's. Back on Earth, Anne finishes up helping the planners get their disguises. Hop Pop has his signature one with the glasses and fake nose, but for the time being, Spring and Polly are sharing a disguise, which if you saw the trailer, you know will change in later episodes. Not gonna lie, I got a little sad when Anne's dad said, not so fast, you three, I mean, you four, when trying to get Anne and the planners to calm down. He said that out of instinct because he was always so used to driving only Anne, Sasha, and Marcy around. Ah, <sighs> feels bad, man. Once inside the market, Sprig is constantly pointing out different technologies, asking if they're robots. Anne's parents are still surprised with how naturally responsible Anne is being too, since she took a picture of the shopping list just in case something happened. And it's good she did because her father forgot the list. Hop Hop explores through the fruits and vegetables aisle, thinking everything is puny until he stumbles upon a durian. Although pleased with its size, he's less than pleased with how the inside of it smells. Shout out to Super Mario Sunshine for teaching me what a durian was when I was seven. To make up for the smell, Anne wants to get Hop Pop food from the Noodle Time restaurant inside the market, which is not in a mall like I thought it would be. This isn't out of the ordinary or anything either, because I'm sure most of you have seen how Targets or Walmarts will have a Starbucks or a Subway inside of them, so this is like that. Her parents continue to be impressed with how mature Anne is acting, mainly after she sees Sprig and Hot Pop trying to wander off on their own and she stops them. Uh-oh. It's him! Man, that theremin music they're playing whenever this thing is on screen gives me the heebie-jeebies. I love it. <laughs> Lanky Frobo continues to sneak up on the gang while they're eating noodles. Unfortunately for him, the fridge magnets he walks by give away his location to Sprig. Since he insta stealths again, Anne doesn't believe him at first until he tries to strangle her, that is. They barely escape it while running into Anne's parents again. Wanting to keep them safe, Anne pretends as if it's not even there. Also, how on planet Earth did Anne's mom not notice the flying noodles go right past her? I know they're not technically floating, but to her they would be, because this thing's invisible. Yeah, I think it's time for your optometrist appointment, Miss Boomjoy. While running away, Hop Pop suggests Anne using her calamity powers to destroy the robot robot, but she still doesn't know how to activate them at will, or just activate them in general. So she comes up with a plan to distract the store with loud music so the others won't notice her fighting the robot. And if you look at the calendar behind the customer service desk, you'll notice the calendar is set to January, meaning if Anne was in Amphibia for five months, she got transported there sometime in August. So not only is Anne's birthday in August, but she likely just started seventh grade before going to Amphibia too. Also, I'm fairly certain that purple cat on the mug is supposed to be a reference to Garfield. He was also on the cover of Sprig's book, so god, Anne's parents are just so adorable, especially your mob. After failing to subdue the robot normally, the gang runs into the employee's only freezer, which is the same freezer I was so confused about how it would come to play in the trailer. Even though the planners get frozen instantly due to being frogs, they still try to help Anne as best they can. The Frobo decides to turn his attention to them instead, almost incinerating them with a laser until Anne activates her powers. This is something I've been saying for a while now, and this scene further backs it up. Anne is only able to hone these powers whenever someone close to her is in some kind of danger or is getting screwed over. The planner's house being destroyed by a veggie monster, Sprig getting dropped thousands of feet in the air, and now the entire family about to be blown to bits. Anne only lands one solid hit on it, so she couldn't destroy it completely, but it was enough to mess up its vision as well as its ability to consistently use stealth mode, forcing it to retreat. Anne passes out just like she did after fighting Andreas, meaning even just a bit of the power drains her energy a ton. Parker's in chat for the durian smell getting her back on her feet. As everyone is leaving the store, Anne tells Pop Pop she wants to refrain from using her calamity powers as much as possible because using them feels, for lack of a better word, to her, bad. I feel like that's because 
because of her instinct to just destroy things while using them. It's a big double-edged sword in a sense. Even though the powers only activate when she's trying to protect or avenge people she cares about, she goes on a destructive rampage while doing so. These powers are rooted from a device called the Calamity Box, after all. And, you know, Calamity is a synonym for words like disaster, crisis, and tragedy. You know, you get the gist of it. The episode ends with a rainy night in Los Angeles, of all places. That's how you know things aren't normal anymore. Rest in peace to the legend, Kobe, by the way. Rest in peace, rest in peace. And we see Lanky Frobo atop a building with gargoyle statues saying how its upgrades and repairs are in progress, vowing it will destroy Anne at all costs. So does this mean it gave itself the new arm and leg if it has the ability to repair itself? Or did he attack again in a repaired normal form, then get repaired by Doc Ock or the IT girls? It's hard to say. It seems like they're going to be treating him kind of like how they treated OG Frobo, where he makes some kind of appearance in damn near every episode from here on out until he's destroyed. And he wasn't missing an arm or a leg here either, just part of his face and torso. Also, this season three outro is so awesome. Definitely more upbeat than the previous two, that's for sure. And Jen Strickland did an amazing job with the animation too. It, it just gave me like anime ending vibes. You ever see the anime Keep Your Hands Off Isaac and how that opening went? It reminds me a lot of that. Let me know in the comments down below what you thought of this episode, what theories you may have based on the new information provided after watching, or if there's any details I might have missed that you would like to point out, I would love to know your thoughts. Of course, if you enjoyed the video, be sure to leave a like down below. It helps out a ton. But for now, I will see you guys next time. Peace out. Take care. Bye-bye.